All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ken Roth. I'm the director of Human Rights Watch. I will introduce our panel in a moment. Um, but we you know, are grateful to President Trump for playing the warm-up act role for us. Um, <laughs> but we were counting on sort of you know, more of the audience transferring over. But we at least, um, we, we know that we have a, a good audience online, and we appreciate all of you for your, your loyalty and interest. Um, and we, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to um, start with um, Zaid Al Hussein, um, just immediately on my left, who is, I think, as many of you know, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who's done a superb job. And, and let's just, you know, get the um, the big topic off the table. Um, what do you think about what Trump just said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from a human rights perspective, I was quite disappointed because I would, I thought there were more issues that they would give, a, he would give us to mull over. The one point that really stuck in my mind, and he said the same thing at the UN in September, is that he urged all countries to pursue their own interests, almost uh, without reference to the fact that if you do all of that, if each country is narrowly pursuing you know, its, its agenda, it will clash with the agendas of others. And we will take the world back to 1913 once again. Power politics, interests to be pursued at the expense of values or rights now. And it's just not possible that you can do that without it all coming apart at some stage and people suffering grievously. So it, it doesn't hold intellectually to make that argument. Ethnic nationalisms, chauvinistic nationalisms, a sense that there is a supremacy within communities determined on the basis of color or ethnicity and that others are somehow lesser people or that certain countries are somehow morally superior to others. Uh, that's what always gets us or seems to get us into trouble. It's the, it's the script of the 20th century, at least the early part. But I uh, was in the Balkans during the war uh, there in the early 90s or mid 90s. And it was also part of what we saw at the end of the last century. And we simply cannot go back there. So I, I, I simply don't understand how you can make that argument and then speak of love and harmony for all peoples. It's just incongruous. You know, obviously, Trump is not the only one making these kinds of arguments. That's and, right. And, and you see this as you travel around the world. That's Can you talk a bit about you know, so how you see this rise of authoritarian populism as a threat to rights and, and what kind of response you're seeing to it that's been effective? Well, it, it's deeply destructive. I mean, it's not anything new. When you go back to that famous mayor of uh, Vienna, Karl Luger, mm -hmm. in the 1890s, who was the first to, to, to really instrumentalize in Europe anti-Semitism for a political end. And he was asked, you know, you have Jewish friends. Why are you so anti-Semitic? And he said he, he didn't see them as, you know, uh, the Jews that he was discussing. <laughs> And one has to recall that when Hitler was in Vienna in 1912 and he went to one of the speeches, it formed the cornerstone of his own sort of deeply embedded sense of anti-Semitism. And from that, you know, emerged something very toxic. And it's these toxic narratives that, that develop out of a chauvinistic nationalism or any sense of exceptionalism that drives uh, us into the ditch as humanity. And so. No, we need, to, we need to base our rhetoric, we need to base our thinking on the rights of everyone. You, we have to sort out our problems, yes, we shouldn't leave people behind, but we shouldn't look for solutions at the expense of those who are already marginalized or weak. And what we're seeing in Europe recently um, with the, uh, the formation of a coalition in Austria, and I have to say, I, I read the uh, document uh, between the two parties, and it's worrisome there because it has within it. I mean, the xenophobia is, is clearly there. And there is a sort of sense that Austria now may start to tack uh, following Hungary and Poland in its sort of anti-European stance. It's, it's, it's sort of dressed up. There is, a, a, so of course, a, a public uh, face to uh, the chancellor here where he seems to be pro-European. Although when you look at the details, I, I worry about it. So we see these trends in Europe and else, elsewhere, of course, uh, it's very evident around the world. All right. Well, let, let's go to one of those elsewheres. And I'm going to turn to, to um, Wei Wei Nu, who is a, an activist um, from Myanmar, who is also Rohingya, and whose um, people have suffered um, you know, probably most dramatically in the last year from 
the kind of outbreak that Zaid described. Could you maybe just let the audience know, you know what happened and how did we get here, not just with respect to the Rohingya, but, but more broadly with, within Myanmar? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. What's happened, I think, um, I don't need to explain too much. It's been all over the news in this uh, for at least for a few months. And um, it's become one of the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. And the, uh, the Bangladesh basically become uh, the largest uh, numbers of refugee recipient country. Um, so I think um, it is what's happening in Burma. It's actually as a result of this ethnic nationalism, uh, which has been uh, uh, seeded and cultivated for decades by the dictatorship in Burma. And um, as you may know, Burma was under the military dictatorship more than five decades, and military has ruled this divide and rule policy at the same time. There was uh, a cultivations of ethnic nationalism, um, basically uh, promotions of Buddhist supremacism uh, and uh, Buddhist Burman supremacy in the society. And that is that uh, fundamental, uh, uh, the, the arise of the, the nationalism is an, actually um, enable the, uh, the crisis to become bigger and bigger and which end up as, um, as, you know, as it is described at the High Commissioner Office report uh, last year in February uh, as amount to crimes against humanity. And basically the entire Rohingya population has been under the threat of their existence and um, uh, at least two thirds of the population has been erased from their homeland and um, uh, almost uh, more than 300 villages in Northern Rakhine state where Rohingya are, uh, have been living, uh, uh, the, the, the three, more than 300 villages has been burned and many people were killed. There were um, very horrific reports on the sexual violence and um, uh, arbitrary detentions and all kind of abuses has been ongoing and, and, and faced by these, um, the, the, the at least uh, more than 600,000 refugee within five months. And it's still continuing. And it can uh, continue, as I said, it is because uh, the, the, because of this, uh, the rise of the Buddhist funda fundamentalisms and nationalisms uh, in the country, uh, while the society is accepted, accept uh, this kind of horrific uh, violation to a community or to a group, uh, while society itself is uh, ignore, I mean, uh, have ignorance on those kind of crimes, and while uh, there is huge number of uh, huge denial of the. Uh, uh, what's going on, uh, what's happened to, to the next door or in our neighbor uh, within, inside the country plus outside of the country. And it's allow the perpetrators to continue and to really uh, create the largest humanitarian crisis. I think this is where we are right now. Yeah. Wei Wei, there, um, I think many people are surprised by the concept of a Buddhist extremist. You know, people tend to think of Buddhism as a nice peaceful religion and, you know, not, as including elements that are spouting hatred. But could you talk a little bit about how Buddhist extremists played out the 969 movement and the like, and particularly the role of Facebook in fomenting this hatred toward the Rohingya and, and other minorities? Yeah, I don't think Buddhism, uh, uh, Buddhist, I do believe Buddhism is a peaceful religion and all other religions are peaceful and teach uh, to have a peaceful life. And that's what uh, my fundamental uh, thought. And, but then, and, I mean, as growing up in Buddhist majority country, I do have like a huge respect to the religion and its practices. But how it's the religious fundamentalism uh, arise in Burma, I think it's because of the systems and unevaling situation. So, so uh, religion has been um, certain part of the, uh, certain element of the religion or groups of religious uh, uh, leaders has been given uh, opportunity to really create the anti-Muslim sentiment or the, to, to really uh, uh, promote propaganda and hate around, around the other groups that, they, uh, that those groups uh, describe, which is maybe Muslims or maybe Christians or maybe many other groups. And it, it, it could happen because 
they were allowed to do it or they were encouraged or they were facilitated to, to be able to do so. And, but surprisingly, not surprisingly, basically, by, by having this uh, uh, fourth industrial revolutions with the development of te technology and social media basically become a, a, an important platform. They have been using the social media, basically Facebook, um, uh, the, the, this group has been using their social media in very effective way to really spread um, uh, the hate and propaganda. While uh, you know people like us, group uh, who, who you know, while the positive narrative has not been um, like uh, effectively coming out, but this negative narrative, uh, in a way, using social media as a platform to create hate, it's it's been really. Uh, in, in the situations of Burma, it's really strong and very institutionalized in a way. They use a lot of resources and effort um, and um, money, you know, a, a lot of resources for really, uh, according to our knowledge. Um, they've been used in very systematic, systemic way while we don't, we're not ready or we don't have enough resources to counter or to really bring positive narrative uh, in systemic way. Okay. Um, Nick Thompson, the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine, who I learned today got his start as a Burma activist. <laughs> so maybe you're um, ideally set to, to bridge, you know, what we see in Myanmar today yeah. and the use of social media as a kind of a double-edged thing. Could you broaden that and, and just talk about, you know, what are the, the benefits and the harms of some of these new platforms? Yeah, it's so interesting, right? So technology gets better every year and it kind of gets deeper into our lives in every year. And of course, with human rights, they're Elements where it can be for great good, right? You can document crimes on YouTube and you can use that as evidence. You can, resistance activists can organize together on Facebook and the state can also track you down, right? Or they can use YouTube to spread propaganda, right? Or they can use satellite imagery to find out where you are in the forest. So technology helps and it hurts. And the question is where the balance of power is, right? And is it more on the side of the human rights activists or is it more on the side of the oppressors? And I was just thinking, Back to when I, when I was a student, and so one of the things I did in the late 90s was spend a lot of time with something called the Free Burma Coalition. And the idea was to get students around the country to put pressure on corporations to withdraw from Burma in the hope of sort of putting pressure on the government, allowing, you know, helping the democratic opposition. And at that time, technology was totally on the side of the human rights activists, right? Because we were sort of the first ones to know how to use it, right? There was very little um, even internet in the state of Burma, the government couldn't really manipulate and control it. And so there was this giant world coalition. It, it, it certainly seemed like technology overall was helping human rights activism. Now it seems the opposite, right? And if you look certainly at what's happening in Myanmar, it, it's certainly a tool of oppression more than it's a tool of liberation. So what shifted? What happened? I don't know, but you know, thinking back to what Ken said at the beginning, I just had a thought that maybe it's that the structure of the most important platforms should sort of push a global community, right? It should be great. You should be able to meet people from around the world, right? You should, we should become more of one people, right? That's, that's how it should work. But it's not. Because of the structure of the algorithms and the way we work it, they actually seem to make us more tribalistic, right? And you can see that in American politics. That's how you get a Trump versus Hillary election. And you can see it in Myanmar. So the structure of the algorithms or the way we use it seems to make us more tribal and less unified. And so that probably is what has tipped the balance a little bit towards technology being more a tool of oppression than of liberation. What's the answer to this? I mean, is it because the, the platforms economically thrive on you know, trying to get you to click and engage as often as possible, which right. tends to push in this tribalistic direction? Yeah. Um, can you count on them to, to revise? Or is George Soros right and we have to start treating them like utilities that need to be regulated? What's the, what's yeah, the answer? So all right, so let's take as a premise that it's definitely the case that platforms make you more tribal, which I don't, you know, it's a complicated debate, but do you accept, if you would accept that as a premise, the first way to fix that would presumably be to have the platforms change the algorithms, right? Like make it so um, people actually do meet other people. So we just wrote a story in Wired. We, we, we actually took on this challenge saying, let's find the place on the internet where people change their minds, right? And where they meet new people. And we found a place on Reddit called Change My View. And you go there and what you do is you submit a view and then people argue with you civilly and they get points if they actually convince you. And it's turned into this sort of this wonderful game in this conversation. And it turns out where like the rare place on the internet where wonderful conversations happen. So you can imagine the major platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all of them, 
saying, okay, let's incorporate something like that into the algorithms. Let's try to get people to change their views. And let's, is somebody who tends to have, if you are an ethnic Burman, let's promote posts from Rohingya, right? Or if you're Rohingya, let's promote posts from the you know, ethnic Karen or something like that. You can imagine Facebook taking that on as a cause. Now, maybe it would hurt their profitability, but perhaps they could do that. The second route would be to regulate them, as Soros suggested yesterday. And I don't exactly know how you do that, but you could, you know, you could put mandates um, on them, or you could say, you could say, <laughs> people are starting to say this, like Facebook, you are responsible if there is ethnic cleansing, and that you can try Facebook, right? You can imagine laws being set up where they are responsible for certain outcomes. So that's another way to change it. Or, you know, the other thing you should do is you should just work to understand it and see it, which is where. Trevor's work comes in. Like learning and actually understanding and visualizing um, what's happening is, is, is something we can do right now. Well, let me move to, to Trevor Paglin, who is a, um, a remarkable artist who uh, The Guardian described you as focusing on hidden spaces. But I, I think that, um, I mean, Nick is describing the problem of the platforms as enhancing tribalism and having you know, us reinforce our own views rather than actually be people who might let us change our minds. Trevor, you've seemed to focus more on a different value, which is the value of, of privacy, of being let alone, of being able to operate anonymously. And your art does that, and your, your public speaking and your intellectual engagement does that as well. Could you just talk a bit about the pros and the cons of technology sure. with respect to, to this concern? Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at a, a platform like a Facebook or a Google or a Verizon, for that matter, um, there's several layers that are going on. Obviously, there's a layer that you experience. You're talking to people. You're interacting with others. You're encountering ideas. There's kind of this cultural, dialogical layer happening. Um, but what you don't see is that there's a whole infrastructure behind it, which is you know, collecting information about you, location data, your preferences, your habits, you know, some really, really intimate details about your life and trying to do stuff with that data. Right? One of the things that I talk about when I talk about technology is that it's never neutral. You know, that what it's going to do is amplify whatever the business model or power interests of whomever it is that actually controls that infrastructure. Like the, the ethics are literally built into the cables and the transistors and the capacitors or what have you. So when we look at that underlying layer, there's an enormous amount of very intimate uh, information about all of us that's being collected. Um, so that you, we see there a kind of concentration of power. Now, today, you know, that's predominantly used to try to sell me you know, more motorcycle boots and you, you know, whatever it is that you might be interested in. But as we see you know, rates of profit decline and that sort of thing, there's all kinds of other ways that it's very easy to imagine because it's already happening, other ways in which that data will be used. Being able to modulate one's access to credit one's access to health insurance in a more kind of capitalist environment. How do you maximize profitability of that data? Um, in other environments where you have more state control or kind of state centralization, you're going to see that uh, data being used, as in, as in the case of China, to modulate one's you know, th things that we would think of as civil liberties, one's ability to travel, one's ability to participate in public. Do you want to just describe the social credit system a bit so people? Yeah, so Ch China has implemented a system that is supposed to be um, you know, widespread by 2020 which monitors all the citizens' online activities and, and gives you points or deducts you points based on how, what, what, how much of a good citizen you are. You know, if you say nice things about the government, your points go up. If you go to work on time, your points go up. If you, you know, all of the behaviors that one engages in that the state wants to promote you know, allows you more access to travel, to get visas, to get access to better schools. You know, discounts on movie tickets, all kinds of you know everyday things that one does in life. And, con and the other thing that it does is looks at who your associations are. You know, are your friends people who have good credit scores? Um, so what this does is, is basically, in a way, modulate one's de facto rights. You know, within that society. And it's easy to single out China because it's a very clear example. But something similar is happening in Europe, in the United States, in South America, all over the world, which is our ability to, you know, again, get access to things like credit or health insurance, which we need to be able to access to, to participate in the society to one extent or another, are also modulated in those kinds of ways. And I because think Because they collect so much data on us. The, because they collect so much because data. Because they collect so much data. You know, for example, if you're a Fitbit, you can sign up for a program where you get a discount on your health insurance because it can monitor, you know, how often you go to the gym and that sort of thing. Um, so this, this kind of dynamic is going to become more and more widespread. And I think this, the question that it suggests 
is do we need a new conception of human rights in this you know, emerging landscape? Do we need to think about what kinds of, what parts of our everyday lives should not be subject to, um, to data collection or, or, or to uh, have consequences? You know, I, I, I guess I think about my own life, when I think about myself as a teenager, like, I broke laws, I didn't go to school, you know, I did all kinds of stuff that um, if I was alive now would have negative and very long lasting consequences uh, for my ability to contribute to society. And so I kind of think about the future, you know, what are, how do we create an equitable future in which people do have um, equal access to the things we need access to in order to participate in society? All right, let me um, bring all of you in now and be a, a bit prescriptive because in a sense, we're, we're seeing different sides of, of this problem. We, we see that these platforms, on the one hand, can do tremendous good. Um, they are you know, a way for like-minded people to communicate. They're a way to challenge governments. Um, it's very difficult for governments to do things secretly anymore because everybody's got a, a mobile phone and can take a picture. So they are empowering. But they also um, tend to make it easier for divisive, hate-driven language to spread. They, they do tend to divide us into categories. And um, they're not only invading our privacy, but they are collecting so much data that um, you know, to where we began with, with this rise of authoritarianism, I mean, China's taking it to a sort of a dystopia extreme. But you can see how, as governments have this degree of control, they can you know, make our lives miserable. But are governments the answer to this then, or are they the problem? Do we want governments? Regulating speech, or is that going to just introduce censorship, which is going to make the internet a more impoverished place for us? Where do we want to go here? I mean, all right, I'll just talk about speech for a minute because it's like one of the most amazing things about covering Silicon Valley over the last, even the last three years, but really the last maybe even 10 years, has been the total change in philosophy on free speech, right? So if you look at Silicon Valley and you look at, say, early Twitter, like early Twitter called itself the free speech wing of the free speech party, right? Everybody talked about, um, you know, and here's another example of Twitter. Twitter made it really easy to have anonymous accounts, right? You just create an account with an egg and say whatever you want. And the reason they did that was because, partly because they wanted to empower dissidents, to allow people to say what they wanted to challenge the government, right? Really good idea, and I thought that was a great idea at the time. But now we've seen what happens, right? So you allow people to have egg accounts, and suddenly it's trolls. Or in the worst case, it's like state-sponsored bot armies, right? And so suddenly it turns out this thing that was invented kind of maybe to help speech and kind of maybe to help human rights can be used to completely abuse it. So what's happened in Silicon Valley is a total flip, right? And so now nobody talks about free speech the way they did 10 years ago, or at least none of the people at the platforms. They talk about wanting to sort of structure speech and encourage kind of speech. And in fact, Google and Instagram have implemented algorithms that automatically filter speech, right? They get rid of what they call toxic comments. But it's not hard to imagine an algorithm designed to identify toxic comments being used identify, I don't know, pleasant comments and elevate them or anti-state comments and like that. So there's a total, total change. And what's also interesting is that it's not really a bad thing, right? I used to think of myself as a free speech absolutist and somebody who really wanted to have maximum speech on the platforms, but the egg accounts kind of destroyed Twitter. So I'm not against Twitter getting rid of the egg accounts. And so both in my own mind and in the conversations going on, there is a real tension and a flip because the absolute position of everybody gets to say what they can, sunlight is the best disinfectant, actually led to kind of chaos. But you also don't want state manipulation particularly, or corporate manipulation particularly when algorithms can like completely sort our speech. So we are in a messy, interesting moment. Let's divide this conversation into two parts if I could. Because on the one hand, there's the issue of anonymous speech yeah. and, and how that has opened up the world to bots. And, and you know, feigned individuals and the like. Um, then separately, there is the problem of, of hate speech, divisive yeah. speech. So let's let's focus for a moment on anonymous speech. Anonymous yeah. speech. Now, you know, one solution to that might be to say there has to be a real person there, so no bots, mm -hmm. but a real person can remain anonymous because there are sometimes good reasons to be anonymous. I mean, is that a good place to be, Zaid mm. or Trevor? I mean, a, I mean, I'll say quickly that is a good starting point, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you can actually like. The anonymity that a platform bakes into it has a huge effect on the conversations, right? So if you look at LinkedIn, which is the least anonymous, because anything you say is not just tied to your picture and your name, it is tied to your whole professional identity. And if you're a jerk, your boss will see it, right? Those conversations are really good. 
Okay. Right? Facebook's kind of one level below that, and Twitter is the worst, because you can just be whoever you want, more or less. So it is absolutely true that the less anonymity you bake in, the better the conversations are. But then you're putting a really high value on sort of quality of conversation and a really low value on the ability of people who want to not disclose their identities being able to participate in conversations. Where would we put the, the other three of you? Yeah. Where would you put the balance? Well, of course, all of this is occurring in a context where there are laws that uh, basically distinguish between freedom of expression and incitement to hatred. In the, in the US, you have the First Amendment. Uh, throughout much of the world, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, is a binding document on states, and it distinguishes <laughs> that between the two. It, there is no fine print in terms of how you get to the these gray areas, but we're working on formula for this. And I'm beginning to think if we convert it into mathematical formula, we could probably find the algorithms for that as well. And, and states do have an obligation to keep a very wide berth available for freedom of expression, the maximum extent. But once you begin to move a whole population to the extreme, so the, the thinking is, of course, that it's the best check against tyranny. You know, cacophony of sound and, and discussions raging back and forth. The danger with the social media is that it's not that you have one or two outliers that you get used to, you know, spewing out some stuff, which is all right, let them do it, it's, we can take it. It's when suddenly there's a density of hatred that has moved center to the right or extreme left or wherever it may be that then poses an overall threat to the entire society and then you're in huge trouble. And the laws are there, and it's just understanding you know, how the law applies. And what was remarkable to me, being in Silicon Valley in September, is I didn't get the impression that those who determine what is on and what content comes off are really aware of the applicable legal standard. And it's a matter of sort of informing them, and then getting to the engineers, getting to the companies, and saying, look, you're not just technologists, you're not just working on algorithms, you're actually contributing in some way to the maintenance of the well-being of humanity. And so be aware of your responsibilities for goodness sake, you know, because you can create amazing good for, the, for us and you can create amazing harm. And, and that's, I think, the point that we have to make. So I keep going back to these discussions that uh, Niels Bohr had in Los Alamos with the uh, physicists who were working on the atomic project and they were just sitting there trying to figure out how to make fission work in a way that would convert it into a weapon. And they were so determined to make it work. And he kept saying to them, think about the consequences. I mean, he wasn't going to stop the project, but he was so concerned about where this was all going to lead. And Oppenheimer wanted him to explain this to the physicists. I mean, they, he, they needed to hear it. What I think we need to do now is have more of these companies, have more people, ethicists, those who care about these uh, con the consequences, um, uh, sort of embed themselves in these companies. Well, I want to add something to what you said earlier, too, is that you, you mentioned that the availability of these platforms dramatically increased transparency. And I think that that's true on one hand. On the other hand, I, I worked on the Ed Snowden project. And when we started looking at that, it described a system of mass surveillance that literally nobody else in the world had imagined could exist. People in the technology industry understood that it was technically possible to build something like that, but had, nobody suspected that the scale of that system was what it was. Another thing we learned from that, um, you know, I worked with a lot of Human Rights Watch people in the aughts on the CIA. We always assumed the CIA was a relatively small intelligence agency, actually around four or five billion dollars, and we got the black budget from Snowden. Turns out it's the biggest one, 25 billion dollars. The point being that it is possible to have massive secret structures that, you know, in the age of the internet. And I would, I would make an analogy here to looking at, at a Facebook or a Google, and I would sort of advocate that we would want to see more transparency on the back end. What are they actually collecting? What are they doing with it? Who is subscribing to it? Who is using these platforms in what kinds of ways? And I, for me, I think that would be an, a part of an overall remedy, not just you know, regulating speech, which, which you know, I, I bristle at a little bit, but I definitely would advocate for much more transparency in the platforms themselves. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, there are sort of two different strains of that. Um, maybe let me just come back to you on, on the regulating speech, and then I think we want to look a bit more at, at the big data analysis and what that means for us. But 
you know, in principle, where we, it sounds great, like let's stop hate speech. You know, I mean, who wants hate speech out there? You know, but it tends to be the powerful who decide, you know, hatred towards whom really matters. And I think it's interesting to look at how this played out in Burma because um, there has actually been somewhat selective concern about hate speech, if I understand correctly. Um, sorry, selective. Concern uh, about hate speech. In other words, there, if you look at you know, what is permitted on Facebook and what is not permitted on Facebook, is it equal concern across the board for kinds of hate speech? Yeah, I think, um, I think Facebook basically play a huge role in Myanmar current situation. And um, I just feel like uh, it is quite dangerous because, uh, you know, how do we make sure the uh, information privacy, uh, the, in, the Facebook basically asks to provide people like data, biodata most of the time. And if we want accreditation and they, we did literally need to give all the biodata. And we've been hearing that the Facebook, uh, uh, I mean, at, certain, at some point, they somehow coordinate with a government uh, uh, in most many cases, uh, like um, sometimes in, 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 in this kind of, I mean, the companies has to provide uh, the information about the users if, if uh, the government requested. So uh, I'm really concerned about the uh, information privacy and, and, and privacy of the, I mean, uh, the, 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 the users. And um, what has been happening uh, when it's come to the balance in, uh, uh, on hate speech is, uh, uh, we don't know what's going on behind the curtain uh, with the Facebook, but uh, it's clearly saying that some, there are some anonymous uh, account, but those anonymous account who are promoting uh, or countering hate speech and racism, those account has been targeted or watched or sometimes even deleted. But at the same time, those account who has been creating, uh, promoting hate are being allowed or sustained. Uh, although it's uh, among the public, you know, it's obvious that who is who. Hmm. But, in, in, uh, but from the Facebook version, we have seen that um, a lot of the accounts who has been countering uh, hate speech, hate speeches, and, and racism are being deleted, and why the the, uh, the 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 other part of the like, for example, like hate, hate speech users are being allowed to continue. So this is something that quite worries them. So I really want to see these companies are really responsible on 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 the way they operate uh, in the country level and state level, and because we clearly. Uh, you know, like started to realize that this uh, platform has been, this, this, this social media platform has been used to really um, create the conflict and violence and, and which really basically feel, uh, fueling the situations like, you know, the, uh, her, uh, mass atrocities and crimes. So it is, it is really important that the, mainly for the Facebook, I have, I have a huge concern I think they really have to put the principles of um, uh, protecting uh, privacy of the people at the same time taking responsibility, uh, uh, you know, how they really operate in the ground uh, in terms of avoiding the uh, uh, social pro uh, uh, problems like, you know, basically like contributing to the, uh, the uh, crimes. Uh, that is very important and, and it, is, it is a huge concern. Could I jump in there? Please. I, I, we're we're uh, advocating together with Human Rights Watch and many of the human rights organizations for there to be accountability for, for what has happened in Northern Rakhine. And uh, uh, we're going to do this forcefully over the next few months. And we hope the senior uh, officers in the military in the Tatmadaw pay attention, including uh, Minau Lang. Uh, it would be interesting to know whether uh, uh, in the future, as we set up an accountability mechanism, or indeed we get to a stage where you hold trials, and a company like Facebook then uh, is subpoenaed by the judicial authorities, and you're dealing now with really serious issues, uh, to what extent they will then 
uh, work uh, uh, positively, or let's say in a in a manner that is is uh, you know is in, in the way that we expect them to uh, work, hand over the data, whatever data they have, uh, because clearly there was uh, much incitement that uh, over the years, when you take uh, the situation of the Rohingya, they lost more rights from 2012 to 2017 than they did in the previous 50 years. And so this has been a, a, a trend that has been very clear. And alongside this has been this incitement to hatred, which has reached fever pitch in the most recent times. Mm -hmm. But it would be very interesting to see how they would respond to these sorts of requests. So that's, I think, really complicated. Um, so the way that the tech companies sort of ha so far have had immunity, you know, in the United States, immunity from regulation, immunity from, you know, courts. So they say we're a platform, right? We're a platform, so we just let people publish. We're not responsible for what people publish on it. Um, as soon as you start to raise the specter that, and one of the reasons why they're able to maintain that is because they don't actually modify content or try to, like, knock out hateful content or elevate good content. They don't actively try to sort of sort and edit their platform, right? And part of the reason they don't sort and edit their platform is because they feel like you would lose that immunity. So now they're starting to do that, right? And you've seen Facebook make a bunch of announcements that they're going to, for example, rank um, news publications based on whether they're trustworthy, right, and elevate them or whether they inform people. And I think that's a good step in the right direction. But the risk is once they start to do that, they could be more liable for things like human rights trials or like government regulation. So the risk is if you start to talk about the possibility of subpoenaing them for human rights violations, their position might be, oh, ah, we're going to back off completely. We're not going to do anything to try to sort and filter the content. We're not going to try to you know, introduce you to people from an ethnic group you don't know or elevate more informed content because we've got to maintain our, sort of, our platform excuse. So it's a really interesting way that you it could incentivize yeah. good behavior, yeah, yeah. and it could actually incentivize bad behavior. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Although there may also be a difference. I mean, what you're talking about is liability. So yeah. Yeah. if you're, um, well, nobody, yeah. nobody, nobody holds the phone company responsible because I made a phone call saying, you know, Zaid killed his neighbor. Right. And so but, but, if, but they could hold Wired responsible if you print that mm -hmm. because you made an editorial decision. Right. So where are the platforms Where is in Facebook between? in between? Right. And so in the, the particular case of Myanmar, if what Facebook is doing is actively colluding with the government to delete dissident accounts and elevate oppressive accounts, then, yeah, screw them, right? If what they're doing is they have an algorithm that, because of the way it's evolved over time, sort of promotes tribalism and... Um, you know, possibly sometimes hatred, then work to kind of fix the algorithm. So it actually, I, it depends on what exactly they're doing, how I feel on, on this issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe screw them is too hard. I mean, they are complying with local laws, but they should, they should not do that if they are, in fact, doing that, which it sounds like they are. Yeah, I mean, also, there's, I, I think we, you know, when we say Facebook deleted an account, I'd be really surprised if Facebook did that on its own. You know, because, I mean, after all, it's the Burmese government that it is, is now prosecuting two Reuters journalists for hate speech against the government because they were investigating a, a mass atrocity against the Rohingya. So, you know, I, I think we have to recognize that these platforms operating in various countries are very susceptible to government interference. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think that's a very different thing from the idea of, you know, turning over data. But that also raises questions because, you know, it sounds great mm -hmm. to turn over data to help prosecute crimes against humanity, you know, by all means. Mm -hmm. But what happens when China says, turn over your data, we want to know who that person is, yeah. Who was you know spewing this anti-government rhetoric? Yeah. Um, and you know right now the, the platform answer is yeah. keep your data out of China. Yeah. You know we start here we can't give it to you sorry. You know which is a good answer but China's saying you want to operate here you got to put your data here. Yeah. And and then you know the companies risk being complicit in not only censorship but actually prosecution of people for being dissidents. Yeah. So I don't you know these are complicated issues. They're complicated issues. And you remind me of uh, Venezuela. This uh, month, they arrested two, pe two people under this new uh, uh, sort of anti-hatred law. And uh, on the face of it, you would think, well, it's not bad to have uh, an a, a affirmation that incitement to hatred 
it's unlawful, but it's being applied against those who are criticizing the government. And so you can see the way that this is all being manipulated. Yeah. I mean, look, whenever you have a situation of power, you know, the powerful tend to protect their own. Mm. And, and so the governments that enforce hate laws tend to protect the powerful first. Right. And it tends to be the minorities, as, like the Rohingya, right. who get screwed in the process. Right. You know, so it's, and, and that's the difficulty. But on the other hand, I mean, if you say, okay, let's just ask the platforms to do that, you get into the liability issue that Nick is outlining. Or, you know, I mean, as Trevor's saying, mm. do we trust these platforms? You know, mm. I mean, mm. and is there a way we can introduce, you know, more popular control mm. in the, is there, I mean, what are your prescriptions, um, Trevor, in terms of, you know, is there a way that we can actually through, you know, more nuanced, refined consent, recapture some control of these virtual, identities that are being created for us and that with big data analysis in many ways, you know, are, are probably more important than just our physical identities walking around. No, I mean, this is something that I think about a lot. And I'm going to say something that's very going to be very unpopular at WEF, but I don't think that there's market solutions to this kind of stuff. Like in the sense that I think that if you're a company, you are set up in such a way you have certain ob obligations to your shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that those are gonna be fundamentally incompatible with the platforms that we would like to have in the future as those of us who care about civil liberties and more equitable societies. So I don't know technically how this would work, but I think conceptually we have to come to an understanding of uh, almost like a new space of, of civic space, really online, and think about what areas of the online world do we want to have be like a library. A library is a place where you can check out any book that you want and the police don't get a record of it. And that second part is just as important as the first part in terms of it being a democratic institution. And this seems like a ridiculous thing to say, particularly you know, as an American and looking at the way that the government functions, but I really do feel like there has to be a new sense of civil society and a new conception of human rights. Um, that, that, that seems intuitive to me, to me that that's gonna be the way forward. But if you, I mean, it's easy to say I should read whatever I want without people knowing. But should I be able to say whatever I want without people knowing? Or you know, does the world then look more like Twitter than LinkedIn, coming back to, to Nick's point? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that it's, that there's got to be a smarter way to do that. And, I, and I, I think one path to that is more transparency on the part of the, the companies themselves, of the, of the algorithm themselves. You know, some transparency, but like, how do these systems actually work? Can we look into them and see what kinds of things they're by default promoting, whether or not anybody's at the controls or not? Um, and I only say that because when we look at the history of hate speech or, or whatever, you know, in, in the history of laws themselves, you know, in the past it was illegal to be homosexual. You know, it was, you know, illegal to marry somebody from a different sex. And so when when we look at the uh, history of that relationship between law and speech and anonymity and what people do, um, it's only by breaking the laws and having very unpopular opinions that there has been some modicum of social progress. So we don't want to lose that. We have just a few minutes left. Do we have a microphone so we can? OK, so um, let me just turn to the audience. And, and um, right up here in the front row, we have a, a question. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sausan. I'm a Palestinian from Israel, and I do strategic litigation before the Israeli Supreme Court on behalf of Palestinians. And we have been facing a lot of the issues that you have addressed uh, regarding technology and limiting freedom of expression, mainly with regards to Palestinians. But I was wondering, uh, my experience goes mainly on social and economic rights. And I was wondering about the relation between technology and social and economic rights uh, in the context that you have been uh, addressing today. So technology can help with e-learning, more kids to get educated, access to internet can help uh, on health issues or on social uh, credit or e like uh, uh, economic rights or getting more social welfare. But we know that uh, technology or half of the world basically is disconnected from internet or doesn't have access to internet. So there is a lot of fear uh, in few years that the same technology that might help to more education, more health, more and so on, will lead to more inequalities that we have been try 
trying mm. for a long time to basically eradicate and eliminate. And I haven't seen so far any, uh, or maybe it's may, maybe there are, and I'm not aware of, uh, like, is there any kind of uh, thoughts to address uh, this issue within the international law? Because, Mr. Hassan, you, you have uh, a, a addressed the issue in the beginning that there should be a, a reconsideration or maybe like a, a re-reading of uh, the human rights into, uh, law in the conventions, which address the very conservative right to education on a very conservative level, but not on a level that combines between technology and education. So, so does, what are your thoughts yeah, on so this? So does technology help or hurt the problem of inequality? Mm. It's, it's a, it does both. It, it's, not, it's not binary, uh, so, so, so it does both. It depends on the context, of course, and, and how uh, the authorities in question uh, try to employ it when considering the right to education and the equal right to education and what sort of education. And uh, uh, when I first began to think about this years ago and the amount of inf information available to us doesn't make us necessarily better thinkers. I used to think to myself, info, info, everywhere, not a thought to think. And in, to a certain extent, it sort of it describes where we are. And, um, and yesterday, uh, George Soros spoke to the press about this, that there's a sort of deadening of mind almost, because sometimes there's so much and there's no clarity in the way we're thinking this. But clearly, what you see also in many uh, parts of the world where you don't have proper, proper infrastructure and there is access to the internet. You're, you have access to some of the, the greatest minds, the, the top lectures. And I remember uh, talking and listening to some Iraqis say how uh, 10 years ago, they used to download lectures from various universities around the world when their own uh, universities were not uh, functioning. And, and so the access to education can be greatly enabled by technology. Uh, but at the same time, it cannot, uh, you know, create problems uh, of the mind, which uh, we need to be uh, aware of as well. Yeah. I just say briefly that, I can't even make it brief because it's so complicated, but technology has this really weird thing where it helps, it definitely helps it, like, become an individual entrepreneur and start a company or start a marketplace and sell stuff on eBay or become a driver and, you know, join with Uber. So, like, it helps you, it helps it sort of the most unequal parts of the economic scale. And that's good, right? But what it also does is because of network effects, right? And the people who get the most people to join their network, it makes it easier to get the next person to join, which makes it easier to get the next person, leads to this massive consolidation, right? So you see massive accumulation of wealth at the top end and the destruction of stuff in the middle, mm. right? So you end up like, let's just take Uber, right? Makes it great for people who don't have jobs to get drive, you know, jobs as drivers, right? Makes it not good for all the cab companies and everything else that it totally knocks out of business, and then accumulates massive amounts of wealth to a very small number of people who invested in it. So it's like, it, it does do good, right? And then it also, you know, it, it probably, I don't even, I'm sure WEF has this somewhere, if you were to chart technological development or technological penetration in a country and inequality, you would probably see that inequality increases, mm -hmm. right? And so then the question is, can you regulate the tech companies or can you regulate the markets in a way to counter that? Can you... Um, you know, can the public sector, you know, uh, help in certain ways? Can the education help system work in certain ways? But technology should, it should, it should be a force for equality, and it's not. And so the big question is how to, how to make it that. Um, yes, right up here in the front, John. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Paulo Kumu with the uh, Africa Platform, Best in Nairobi. And you speak up a little bit, please. I, I just listened to this conversation, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, other than this being the choir, I am wondering whether we need to begin rethinking how we advocate for human rights. And I've got two reasons for this. One is uh, I think th those who are in civil society, we are still caught up in this belief that we had had since our founding that there's something called public sector, there is private sector, and there is civil society. But what you've noticed is that the, the, those businesses and companies have merged. Uh, businesses and, and governments merged a long time ago. They got married, they had a wedding, and they're living happily ever after. <laughs> but we still don't see that. So we still think that there's some regulator somewhere who needs to do something. There is some private sector who needs to do something. But just listen to any uh, government leader speak. 
and they, they speak the language of business yeah. almost right from the beginning. You didn't listen do that earlier to, today, did you? Yes, listen. <laughs> Do the same with, uh, with any major uh, whatever business person, mm -hmm. and they could be seated on a political stage and they would say the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether those of us who are in human rights mm -hmm. are still stuck in the old mode, and then maybe we need to rethink who we advocate with. So that's the first part. Mm -hmm. But the second part is the tendency to go to the top layer advocacy. So there's a lot of conversation here about what Facebook, uh, Facebook is doing, but nobody's talking about the consolidation that people like Amazon are beginning to have. Nobody's talking about how much power Google is now using to decide what we see and what we don't see. If you were to open every website, including that of the, of the Human Rights Watch, mm -hmm. the very first thing that you see is we use cookies. Mm -hmm. And these cookies is to help us enhance your experience. Mm -hmm. But actually they are saying what we want to do is to capture your habits and then use that to make whatever decisions we had. But we don't seem to see those subtle things as building up to the massive things that now Facebook do. So they, they start off very nicely, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't seem to see them starting that way. But when two or three now become massive and then that, they now become an issue, we focus on those. But literally all of us here are guilty of capturing information. Sometimes we pretend that we are seeking people's information but what we simply do is that we entice them with nice knowledge and nice information, but in the process we capture whatever, a lot of things. Is in that not an abuse of human rights? Okay, Trevor, I think this makes sense for you. It's, I mean, on the one hand, we have this, you know, can you trust government to regulate business when they are so aligned in interest? And, and how do we enter into that yeah. and, and you know, gain control? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that is the question, right? I mean, and especially in a society like the US where, where it is such a, intensely neoliberal kind of setup. Um, I think there's some positive directions people are trying to figure out. Um, New York City, for example, just passed a law that if you're gonna use algorithms in doing criminal justice sentencing, which is becoming a bigger, bigger thing, you have to have auditable systems, which is actually very hard to do with machine learning systems. Um, so there is, so there are due process requirements that you can, that you can place, that, that's definitely one approach, and that's something that the ACLU has been like sort of at the forefront at, as well as the AI Now Institute at NYU, is trying to think about how do you insert more traditional concepts of justice and, and the functioning of justice into the um, oversight of platforms that are becoming such a part of our everyday life. So I think there's some little examples of that, and I think that there's just really smart people that are thinking at exactly about that question right now. But I think we're at the really early stages of being able to conceptualize it. Okay. No, I mean, the question is a great question. Because in many countries, the elites uh, dominate every space. And the government and the private sector and the military and the intelligence are all indistinguishable. It's the same group of people, essentially, that run the country. And to think that at, at a national level, you could have a regulator distinct from the judiciary or the military, and it's all the same, uh, it, it, I mean, it's perfect. Um, and so maybe we have to define you know, new uh, international instruments and to see how you do that is quite, uh, I mean, it's quite difficult to imagine it, but perhaps that's where we need to go and, and, and civil society and, uh, and certainly those organizations that have a, a broad imprint, a, a sort of imprint need to, need to think about this deeply. I mean, it's a great question, great question. I, I would like to have a little bit of faith in the idea that a critical mass of countries or nation states of civil societies could have a big influence on how the whole platform works. In other words, if, if, a, if a kind of mass of people got together and articulated a series of guidelines, I think that those guidelines could become much more widespread um, just simply as a result of the fact that these are planetary scale infrastructures. Yeah. And it probably is going to take a bottom up approach like that because yeah. top down is just too captured at this stage. Yeah. And we had a question up here. Yes. Thank you. I'm Mike Abramowitz from Freedom House. Thank you for a great panel. I just wanted to pick up on the gentleman's question about the business community. Um, you know, being here in Davos for the week has made me maybe a bit more pessimistic about uh, where the business community is on you know, support for democracy and human rights. And I'm just wondering, maybe particularly for Zaid, but uh, any of the panels, you know, what's, what's been your takeaway on that? And specifically, uh, I mean, this has been an issue that all of you have been working on for quite some time, but you know, how do we really make the case for... Uh, you know, for you know, for democracy, for human rights among this community, when there's just so much, you know, money at stake uh, in these conversations. 
Do you want to start with that? I mean, what, if you're, you know, a business is operating in Burma, <laughs> why should they care about democracy? Then? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a question that we have to un, uh, regulate. I think, um, I mean, in the past few decades, maybe after World War II, the world leaders were formed to promote democracy or human rights. Uh, you know, the 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 topic were um, basically popular and. I'm not sure there were real, like a genuine political leadership to really promote those, uh, like the principles or values of democracy and human rights. But in our generations, what we're seeing today and what I have been realizing uh, is there is there is a lack of political uh, will or genuine political will to really promote democracy and human rights and to protect human beings. And, uh, um, and I just think that the human rights agenda basically has been sold for their own interests by the leaders of the world, um, including like, you know, the, the, the most powerful uh, uh, countries' leaders. So, and it has been basically, human rights has been uh, attached to their own interests to uh, geopolitical or business interests. And in most cases, for example, let's say a situations of Rohingya, there aren't enough uh, uh, their uh, interests to really address the, uh, the issue. So the issue has been ignored. Uh, let's say in compare with the uh, situations in Middle East and, and in, in Burma or in, in, in South Asia, uh, attention has not been getting enough. And the issue has been ignored or somehow neglected, um, uh, not prioritized by the uh, um, around the world discussion. So I just felt like we really need the real, like um, moral leadership to really again enhance the uh, value of human rights and democracy. Uh, if and we are kind of like uh, constraining or you know like uh, lacking the moral leadership to really genuinely promote human rights and democracy. And now this is the time we have to uh, understand and realize to really cultivate it again. And this, the platform like this, like, I mean, the WEF and where the, not only the political leaders, but also the, the corporate leaders, private sector leaders has to pay attention and really come up with, uh, with the, uh, you know, at, at certain level of, um, a moral leadership to really uh, uphold the values uh, and uh, the values of uh, human rights and democracy and to protect in people. And this is something that I feel uh, uh, like basically ingenuity at such a shame and very, very sad about this. Okay, well, we're going to have to, I, I think, leave it there. But let me, um, Nick Thompson, Wei Wei Nu, Trevor Peglin, Zaid Al Hussein, let me thank all four of you for your very insightful contributions today. Thank you, thank you all for joining us. Thank you.